the things that you remember are typically the things that were really emotional in your life, that mattered to you, that were surprising, that stood out. And we also can notice ourselves how much we tend to have gaps in some of these memories. And so scientists have been interested in this for a very long time. From the USC Leonard Davis School of Gerontology, this is Lessons in Lifespan Health, a podcast about the science and scientists improving how we live and age. I'm Professor George Shannon, Kevin Shu Chair in Gerontology. On today's episode, how neuroscientist Mara Mather is shedding light on how we learn, what we remember, and where we might find clues to slowing the progression of Alzheimer's disease. Mara Mather is a professor of gerontology and psychology. She leads the Emotion and Cognition Laboratory at the USC Leonard Davis School. And for the past several years, her research has focused on a small region deep inside the brainstem called a locus ceruleus, or blue spot. So the locus ceruleus in a healthy brain is the hub region that integrates all signals about arousal, how awake you are, how alert, how hard you should work, all these sort of signals it's integrating. And then it can send out broadcast to the rest of the brain what state the brain should be in, whether it should be in a state that's geared up for high action, high importance of a situation, or whether it's a more relaxing state. And it it does this communication using noradrenaline, which is a neurotransmitter that is basically noradrenaline, means the brain's adrenaline. And the aspect that we've been studying is how can this small brain region lead to people becoming more focused under arousal. Mather's research builds on an almost century-long exploration into how emotion, a mental state of high arousal, affects how we think, learn, and remember. Some of the emotional memory effects have been studied for nearly a hundred years, so things like we talk about the weapon focus effect where someone might remember if they're the victim of a crime and someone's pointed a gun at them, they typically will remember the gun really well and not remember the perpetrator's face. And that sort of effect that was called attentional narrowing by someone named Easterbrook um, way back in the 1950s. Um, So, and he wrote a whole review paper on these phenomena. There had been enough research, you know, dozens of studies already at that point. So this has been really of interest for many decades because it's a powerful effect. I mean, you can see it in your everyday life. What What is it that you remember? The things that you remember are typically the things that were really emotional in your life that mattered to you, that were surprising, that stood out. And we also can notice ourselves how much we tend to have gaps in some of these memories. And so scientists have been interested in this for a very long time. Mather's interest is in understanding what makes some moments stick in our minds while others disappear. And you might yourself have, you know, surprisingly vivid memories of random things during something like, you know, when you heard about 9-11 or, you know, these sort of flashbulb memories. And so how can we understand what is going to make something stand out and what is going to make something be forgotten under these high stakes situations. And what we realized first of all was that the simple thing that predicts whether or not you're going to focus on something when you're in this high arousal state is whether it matters a lot, whether it really stands out, whether it has a lot of salience, or whether you really care about it. So if you Um, Obviously, a gun is something you should care about in most situations, but there can be lots of individual differences in terms of what really matters to someone. And what stands out can be very simple. It can just be that it has a lot of contrast with the background. And so we've done these experiments where we just alter what stands out perceptually. So say we we flash a bunch of letters on the screen, 
and some of them are dark gray and some of them are light gray against a white background. And we asked people, what letters did you see? Most people will report more of the dark gray letters because they stand out more than the light gray letters. But if we play them an emotional sound just beforehand, they report even more of those really salient letters and fewer of the other letters. So arousal doesn't just help your attention overall. It's making you focus more on what really stands out at that moment. Mather's research shows that memories can be strengthened or weakened, depending on what we're paying attention to before or during an emotionally arousing event. And that it is changes in locus ceruleus activity that help us become more focused in these high stakes moments. However, the effect is not the same across all age groups. And what we're finding is that that works really well for younger adults. For older adults, not so much. Increased distractibility is one hallmark of cognitive aging. And we're seeing that under arousal, older adults pay more attention to anything, uh, not just what stands out the most. So in younger adults, it makes them narrow down their focus to what really matters. And in older adults, it's not really helping them focus so much. So that's a really interesting phenomenon that might explain some of the things that we have seen already in other studies where older adults are especially distractible. And I think those age differences will be biggest under high arousal situations where younger adults would really benefit from the arousal and older adults won't. A recent study Mather did with colleagues at the Max Planck Institute showed that the locus ceruleus literally dims with age. We looked at a sample of several hundred adults and we found among the older adults that the integrity of the locus ceruleus or this uh, brightness that it shows on our MRI images because of its magnetic properties. As that declines with age, it seems that the locus ceruleus is probably showing some neuronal loss. And we found that that signal was associated with how well people did on memory tests. And so people who showed what looked like a uh, more intact locus ceruleus were doing better on memory tests. A loss of brightness is not the only visible change to the locus ceruleus as we grow older. It turns out the locus ceruleus is a really fascinating area to look at in aging because it is the first place that Alzheimer's pathology is seen. And what I mean there is when you hear about Alzheimer's disease, you hear about plaques and tangles. And the plaques are um, amyloid beta pathology, and the tangles are related to tau pathology. And tau pathology happens, um, starts in the brain quite a bit earlier than the amyloid pathology. In fact, a German study of postmortem brains showed tau pathology in the locus ceruleus regardless of age, and regardless of whether the individuals showed signs of Alzheimer's disease while they were alive. They basically took any dead brain they could um, get access to, as far as I can tell. So these weren't necessarily um, any sort of selected population. And so they had a few kids, and then they had more brains, the older you got. They had over 2,000 brains, but they had 100 brains that were between age um, 30 and 40. And they could see that there was at least a little bit of tau pathology in the locus ceruleus in all 100 of these brains, whereas um, in many other parts of these 30-year-old brains, there was no Alzheimer's-related pathology at all. And they never saw a brain that had Alzheimer's pathology somewhere else in the brain, but not in the locus ceruleus. And even in their 10 kids that they looked at, they had a couple kids that had tau pathology in the locus ceruleus. And this um, is quite striking to think about that most of us by age 30 or 40 will have at least a little bit of Alzheimer's pathology in this um, 
brainstem region. Mather believes this changes how we should be thinking about Alzheimer's disease. I think that Alzheimer's is more like cardiovascular disease. It's a spectrum, and we're all somewhere on this spectrum. Uh, we all have a little bit of the disease pathology, the way that um, we probably all have some atherosclerosis lurking somewhere in our um, cardiovascular system. What this means is that um, Alzheimer's is this very slow moving process and what we really want to be doing is slowing it down. In an interesting twist, Mather explains that the very process that is associated with memory benefits around high arousal in younger people may also be part of what causes problems as we age. So we talked about noradrenaline helps your memory and helps memory consolidation. It also helps you create new synapses to create new pathways in the brain and make those more long-lasting. So that high arousal state is helping you to learn new things and shape your brain and keep your brain plastic as you get older or throughout life. But that high energy, high metabolic brain plasticity processes are creating waste. They're producing things like amyloid and tau. So you've got these positive aspects, at least to brain plasticity, but it also can um, lead to more pathology. If you're younger, the, that creation of that byproduct of the metabolic activity is not really a problem because you go to sleep and it clears out. You've got this great deep sleep that is allowing um, clearance of these waste products. But if you're older and your deep sleep isn't so good, then you've got a problem. And so that's where I see these being sort of the yin and the yang of what is really going to help brain health. You need both the high arousal sympathetic nervous system properties that allow for brain plasticity, and you also need these relaxation parasympathetic properties that allow for things to be repaired and for waste to be cleared out. And you need to go through those both of those states every day, pretty much, to maintain a healthy balance of both really high performance and dealing with the consequences of, you know, having had all that brain activity. And so my hope and my ambition is to try to figure out the balance where you can engage um, the brain in intense mental stimulation that leads to growth and neuroplasticity. And we can also figure out optimal ways to either restore deep sleep and enhance that or do these sort of um, meditative or heart rate variability biofeedback sort of practices that can mimic some of the aspects of deep sleep and allow for the clearance of the waste products of that really high mental stimulation. Mather is already leading heart rate and biofeedback-based studies and hopes to expand that line of research to see if it can benefit the brain. Earlier findings looking at the brains of meditators may provide her hints for how to proceed. One study that looked at a large sample of people who have practiced meditation for many years versus people who have not practiced meditation found that when they just used a machine learning technique to guess at how old the brains were of each person, this algorithm guessed that the, uh, on average the meditators' brains were 7.5 years younger than their actual age um, and compared to the control brains, which um, were non-meditators and didn't show that effect. So it seems that meditation is associated with benefits for the actual brain health, which is really interesting whether this might be because over years they've had better clearance of these potentially pathological aspects that when they accumulate for many years eventually lead to Alzheimer's disease. Mather's research on a tiny spot in the brain is now leading to explorations of larger mind and body connections. When it comes to preserving our memories, protecting our thought processes, and preventing disease, 
Her hypothesis is that, like so many aspects in life, our brains need balance. So if you're an athlete and you are working out really hard, that's going to push your muscles and that's what you have to do to get good. But if you're an athlete and you work out super hard every day of the week, you're going to crash and burn. You're going to have a problem because your body needs that other phase, which is to rest and to regenerate and to clear out waste. And the brain works that same way. You want both those, you know, high energy, high intensity. You're really pushing the border of your mental skills in order to develop new pathways in the brain. But you need also these states that you usually get during deep sleep or other parts of sleep that are really restorative. That wraps up this lesson in lifespan health. Thanks to Professor Mara Mather for her time and expertise, and to all of you for choosing to listen. Join us again, and please subscribe to our podcast at lifespanhealth.usc.edu.